Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you this week to our midweek video. I appreciate you tuning in and joining us here. If you haven't already done so, if you consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell here as a way of staying current with our YouTube ministry when we go live from our assembly building on Sunday mornings or when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate having you being a part of our normal listening audience. And by the way, we are hoping by the end of this year, 2022, I'd love to see our subscribers reach 3,000. So if you are enjoying the content on this channel, find it interesting, uh, please share the channel with others. We would certainly appreciate that. Our featured book for the month of September is my book, The King James Bible in America, an orthographic, historical, and textual investigation I wrote this book in 2019. It was published by Dispensational Publishing House. If you're interested in knowing about the printed history of the text in the United States, uh, please consider picking up a copy of the King James Bible in America. also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here. We established this last year in 2021 as an alt text site for our YouTube ministry. Should it, something happen to it, um, if you are into alt text sites or would like an alternative to YouTube, please consider subscribing and joining with us here on Rumble as well. So what I want to talk about in this video is I want to begin a process of interacting with the Textual Confidence Collective, all right? The Textual Confidence Collective uh, was a series of podcasts that were produced throughout this summer of 2022. There are seven episodes in all, and I want to be, people have been asking me my opinions about some of the stuff uh, many people that I know have watched this uh, material that is covered here in the Textual Confidence Collective. And I have followed it and not said anything really or too much about it. I've said maybe one or two things uh, in social media, particularly Facebook, as I've interacted with a couple uh, comments that were actually made in this uh, series of, about me and some of my work, um, which I appreciated the positive uh, way that it was covered and mentioned, which we'll get to uh, in due time. So this material in the Textual Confidence Collective has been interacted with a lot throughout the summer. Uh, specifically, Nick Sayers uh, out of Australia has done a series of videos on this. Um, Nick's videos tend to run long. I mean, we're talking some of them three, four, five hours as he has uh, gone through the, the content that is in the Textual Co Confidence Collective. Um, my approach is going to be different. I'm going to try to just take little uh, smaller chunks and, and interact with, with what was said in the Textual Confidence Collective. Uh, the material presented here has also been interacted with at uh, standardsacredtext.com. Uh, the Van Cleeks have uh, written about this and interacted with it uh, quite a bit throughout the summer, uh, as has... Um, Matthew uh, Bouchard, I'm, I'm probably butchering that last name, otherwise known as Bible Protector. I saw a video on YouTube where he was interacting with material that was shared uh, in the Contextual Confidence Collective. And so um, I'm, I'm electing to sort of do the same thing. Now, some of, some of you who are obviously normal or been at normal, hopefully you're all normal, but uh, you've been involved in this channel or followed this channel for, for quite a long time. You know that I have been engaged at our church, Grace Life Bible Church, in a very lengthy series related to issues of inspiration, preservation, canonicity, transmission, and translation of the Word of God. I've called this class, From This Generation Forever, a study of God's promise to preserve His Word. And I just taught, just yes, just a couple days ago, this past Sunday on September 11. I just taught lesson 179 in this series, and we are currently looking at the notes of John Boyce and the general meeting uh, and trying to study and ascertain what occurred at the general meeting to the extent that we're able. But my point in mentioning that is the issues that the Textual Confidence Collective uh, cover are issues that are near and dear to my heart as I have done my own fair share of study and labor on this topic. In fact, those of you who have followed the channel, you know that I've written on this. Uh, I have published volume one of my study notes from this class, from this Generation Forever class. I've published volume one on the doctrine of uh, inspiration. 
I'm currently working on editing my notes on volume two, which will be the doctrine of preservation. I've also released this book right here, the King James Bible in America that we're featuring this week, as well as a booklet on Psalm 12, six and seven, the preservation of God's words. And then I also have written a book on Easter, the Easter issue in Acts 12, four, don't pass over Easter, a new defense of Easter in Acts 12, four. So all that to say that the, the matters that are being, uh, discussed in the Textual Confidence Collective are issues that are important to me. Uh, they're things that have been on my mind. I've been writing about them, studying about them, uh, interacting with people about them uh, for a, quite a long time. My class began in 2015 and we're now in 2022. And so it's been going on for a while. So the first thing I want to do um, that I think is important to do is sort of talk briefly about who is on the Textual Confidence Collective, who are these men, and just give you a bit of a backstory here. So I'm going to, you can see this picture here. They are sort of uh, sitting around the table there, and um, I want to just sort of talk about them. The first uh, gentleman here is Brother Mark Ward. Brother Mark Ward is the author, and I think I accidentally clicked off of it, but he is the author of Authorized. The Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. Okay, so I have my own copy of this. I have read it. Um, here is Brother Ward's blog by Faith We Stand, where he writes about issues related to the text translation. He also has a YouTube page where he has talked uh, a lot about issues related to the King James Bible. He has also edited and put together this website here, the King James Parallel Bible. And so, um, you know, M Mark Ward has written a lot on this particular topic. Now, in full transparency, uh, Brother Ward is, is saying and does hold to the position that the King James is becoming more and more, shall we say, unintelligible to the modern reader, and that the King James Bible uh, is not long in the future where uh, he surmises it will be completely uh, unintelligible, and therefore we need to be looking at and considering the option of um, modern versions. And so that is kind of the framework from which Mark Ward is coming from. Now, I also want to be honest and full transparency. I am, uh, I've interacted with uh, Brother Ward. We have spoken on the phone. He has my phone number. I have his. We text back and forth uh, related to some of these things. Um, I have found my interactions with him to be uh, profitable, even though we don't uh, see the, see things the same way. And part of my motivation in doing these videos is to just try to explain a little bit more directly sort of where I'm coming from on some of on some of these issues. So this that's that's uh, Brother Ward. This other gentleman here, this is Brother Peter Monto Montero Montoro. I hope I'm saying that right um, of the. Four men on the collective, he is the one that I'm the least familiar with. So I don't mean any disrespect uh, to to Peter, but I just I just am not familiar with him uh, to the same level and degree that I am with the other uh, three men that are on the Textual Confidence Collective. This gentleman here immediately now to the left, to the next, the next person to the left, this is Brother Tim Berg, okay? Uh, Brother Tim Berg is the owner, editor, researcher of the of King James Bible History. And he has put this website together, written excellent content. He's also the um, he's also written other ar articles and so forth for text and canon, and other things. Um, I consider I thought I knew a lot about the history of the King James Bible, until I started interacting with uh, Brother Timothy Berg. Um, he has been exceedingly gracious. We have talked on numerous occasions, you know, behind the scenes. I've talked to him on the phone once. We've interacted a ton on Facebook Messenger. He is extremely generous as far as sharing information on the history of the King James Bible. Um, even though I don't agree with him on text critical issues and so forth, I would say that he is arguably the, the most knowledgeable person I know on the history of the King James Bible. And um, I, find it, I find it to be refreshing to talk to him about those things. And we have been able to have a relationship, even though we don't necessarily see eye to eye on uh, all matters related to uh, text criticism. But 
His work uh, and history has benefited me. I've cited him and used his work in my class. And again, he has been extremely generous in sharing information. And I appreciate uh, Brother Timothy Berg immensely. And then finally, we have here, um, this is Brother Elijah Hickson. I am aware of Elijah Hickson. Uh, let me bring this back to the top. Via, I was first made aware of him through discussions online related to Codex Sinaiticus and whether or not it is a uh, 19th century forgery. And I have I was first aware of him through some of his reviews that he had written as it pertains to uh, Is the World's Oldest Bible a Fake by David W. Daniels. And then I have also been aware of him. Here's his other uh, response to um, Brother David Daniels' work on whether or not Codex uh, Sinaiticus is a 19th century forgery. So I'm, I'm mostly aware of uh, Hickson through reading this material and interacting with this subject matter. And I also have uh, Hickson's co-edited book, uh, Myths and Mistakes in New Testament Textual Criticism. So all that to say that the different men here that are a part of the collective are, uh, I'm familiar with them, have personal relationships with them to varying degrees, uh, most notably uh, Mark Ward and uh, Timothy Bird. Let me just say, I, I believe that one should be having um, dialogue with people with which they do not agree. And I have been pressed and stretched in my own thinking on some things as a result of interacting with these brothers, uh, even though I don't agree with everything that they have to say. Um, I have found them to be, at least in my dealings with them personally, I've found them to be gracious. I've found them to be uh, more than uh, generous as far as uh, time and resources. And I hope to be able to communicate in this series of videos that I'm going to do interacting with theirs uh, in the same manner, uh, dare we say, uh, as Colossians 4 says, um, with, great, with, with speech that is with grace seasoned with salt. Um, and I do think that there are, I do have some, di some major disagreements with them on uh, some, the, some of the points here. And I hope to be able to set forth in these uh, videos sort of my standpoint I feel that I have staked out some thinking on this on this issue on these issues related to text and translation that is somewhat unique. I've not heard anyone else explain uh, some things the way that I've come to think about them, um, and I think I hope that's uh, beneficial to the body of Christ in, lar uh, in large. And I want to cover some of those things. So unless you've gone through 178 hours of the material that I've covered in my class. There's some things uh, within the class that I think are pertinent and related to what is covered in the um, in the contextual confidence collective. So I'm not I'm going to try to keep each video relatively on point. Uh, this first one might be a little bit more rambling, and I I feel like it kind of is already. But um, I'm going to do my best to try to to try to lock in and zero in on, on keeping each one of these on a specific focus. And on a specific topic. And this one, I'm kind of having to introduce, you know, what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So it's probably taking a little bit longer. Now we're going to jump in here to some of the video of episode number one. And I just want to be clear, I'm going to be playing this at 1.5 speed. And the reason I'm doing that is just to hopefully speed up the, the, the video here a little bit. But I think it's important to start off with to hear from these brothers about what their goals are in the Textual Confidence Collective. And one of the first things they do is they set forth what they call three poles of, relay, of, of thinking or interacting or dealing with the text. And we're going to jump in here and listen to about the first seven and a half minutes uh, at 1.5 speed. Over and over and over again, people's eyes eyes would blaze over when people were quoting the King James to them. And I just thought, what are we doing? The King James Bible had been at the center of my faith for my entire life up to that point. And the Lord in his mercy shifted things in my heart so that Jesus was at the center of my faith. We want a robust confidence that is unshakable and that can deal with human the fact that we don't get things perfect. And that's okay. God knows that. God still speaks to us. You are listening to the Textual Confidence Collective. We're a group of friends who met at a theology conference a couple years ago and have kept up online 
calling ourselves sort of informally, we'll see if the name sticks, the Textual Competence Collective, an august name for a tiny group of buddies who just love to talk about promoting competence in the text of scripture against different forms of what we call textual absolutism, which we'll define. That includes especially, and not only, various forms of defensive exclusive use of the King James Version. So you are either watching or listening to the first of seven discussions on textual competence among us, these friends. We're going to cover the history of textual transmission of the Bible. That is how the Bible came down to us over time. Then the theology of textual transmission. Then the story of the Textus Receptus, that's the Greek New Testament edition, broadly speaking, behind the King James Version. And then some of the nitty gritty of textual criticism. We've got some experts, two world experts, sir, working on it uh, in our little group, and two guys who also know a thing or three, or maybe two in my case. So even before I get everybody to tell their stories and therefore introduce themselves, I'd actually like to ask pastor and PhD candidate, Peter Montoro, who hails from my state, to explain the three polls that we see in this debate. Take it away, Peter. So there's basically three uh, three positions uh, that we, we've used to sort of put together a spectrum of, of, of a map, as it were, of this of, of um, positions on the text. So you have a textual skepticism, textual absolutism, and textual competence. So a textual skeptic would be someone like Bart Ehrman. Ehrman would say, well, if God really gave us the Bible, then he would have given it to us on golden tablets or written it in the sky so that we would know if he inspired it, he would give us every word exactly uh, the way he wanted us to have it. We would not have to do textual criticism. We don't have to compare manuscripts. Um, and Ehrman would say, because we have to do this work, because we have to toil on the text, and therefore we can't trust the text because if we have any uncertainty at all, then we just don't know what God said. And so therefore it can't be God who's speaking, it has to be men who are speaking. That'd be roughly a summary, be a lot more nuanced than that, but that's basically his position. Uh, and then there are many people, this is the way I was brought up to believe, that um, their position is, well, if we can, we have to know the words exactly, we have to have absolute confidence in every single word uh, to be able to trust the text. But we believe the Bible's the word of God. Uh, and so therefore, we must not have to do any work on the manuscripts. We must have every Greek word or every English word, even in the King James, exactly right. Uh, and because we do trust the text, and because we believe this is necessary uh, to trust the text, therefore we're going to so postulate, uh, we're going to say uh, that okay. this is actually what took place. And what we'd want to, to push, right, exactly. So that'd be a textual absolutist perspective, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, and then a, a position of textual confidence would say that toil and trust can go together. So that because of what we believe in the providence of God, and because we believe that God can use ordinary human beings to transmit his word, and I'll be talking more about this later on, uh, but just how God uses ordinary human beings to preach his word. He also has used ordinary human beings to copy and translate and to edit and to do all the other things uh, that are done with the word of God. And yet God is still at work through human beings, uh, just as he is in the church and in, in all the other acts of God's providence. Uh, and so we want to say to Bart Ehrman, we would... We would say, no, we don't want to be skeptical, but you don't have to become the mere image of Ehrman uh, in order to have trust in the text. And, and really, one of the things that I, I think a lot about is this idea, it's called horseshoe theory, that the more you focus on your opponents, the more you become like them. And so the two extremes tend to, tend to bend towards each other. Uh, so you see this with you know, fascism and communism. Actually, on the ground, they don't look that different. So in theory, one's extreme right and one's extreme left. But in practice, they are very, very similar. Uh, and so you see that a lot. The more you focus on your ideological opponents, the more you become like them. And so what we want to say is let's back off. Um, from trying to be the mere image of Ehrman and saying the opposite of everything that, that he would say, uh, and let's focus on the actual broad, big place to stand that God has given us, a confidence in the text and toil on the text and trust in the text. And we would label that position textual confidence. And there's you know, room for uh, different positions um, and you know, without text. So let's make sure we understand what uh, Brother Montero has just said there. They, they're, they're staking out three positions. And if we think of it as a spectrum, on one end of the spectrum, they have what they call textual absolutism. And on the other end, they have textual skepticism. So on the textual skepticism side, they uh, use Bart Ehrman as a way, as a sort of emblematic representation of skepticism. Um, over here on my bookcase, I have three or four books by Ehrman. I'll probably be talking about them a little bit more specifically in a future one of these episodes. But you got Ehrman on one side, and then on the other side, you have what they are calling absolutism. All right. So this would be the idea that every single, that, that, that one particular form of the text, one particular version um, in a later episode, they're going to talk about, you know, how the, how that was the case with the Roman Catholics uh, in the Middle Ages with the um, uh, the Vulgate. And they, they have this dichotomy now between, or a spectrum, I would say more accurately, between absolutism and uh, skepticism. And then that middle space in between, they're staking out as textual confidence. And so essentially what the position of the Textual Confidence Collective is, is that we want to stay away from the extremes of absolutism and skepticism and be in the middle space of textual confidence. And you can hear uh, a little bit more about that here. Uh, I think uh, it's Brother Ward who might got to basically speak to that point here. 
actual confidence. Within actual confidence, exactly. Yeah. There's room for a few different places, you know, places to stand within that, but we want to get people off the ledges uh, right. because they can take you to a bad place. But we're, we're not saying that our, the people who prefer the King James exclusively are fascist or communist. Let's just be clear about that. Very clear about that. No, yeah. not saying just that. Just a, a parallel. As, as you mentioned, the horseshoe theory, I've seen this in action, actually. So I've, I've seen uh, discussions about particular textual variants and someone who is a textual absolutist saying, like, well, we don't even have enough manuscripts for that book, the Bible, anyway. So there's no way you can reconstruct it, which is ironically the same argument you would get from someone like Bart Ehrman. And they end up undercutting, and this is what I'm most passionate about, they end up undercutting people's confidence in the Bible across the board right. in order to defend every iota of their, their preferred position. Right. They, end up, they end up cutting the props out from under everybody. Right. right. So I, I've, I've heard Tim, I think, say before, and I thought this was really perceptive, whoever said it was perceptive, that they've never heard more attacks on the Bible or um, efforts to undermine people's trust in it than they have from those who are defending an absolutist perspective on the yep. King James Version. So everybody knows that when you've got three positions laid out, the third one is right, right? <laughs> so we are adopting this terminology, we believe, in textual confidence, and we're trying to set that up in contradistinction to textual skepticism and textual absolutism. And if you're going to understand, these, any listeners or viewers are going to understand the conversations that we're going to have in, Lord willing, six more episodes after this one, they're going to need to remember those three perspectives. Again, textual skepticism, textual absolutism, and the right one, that is the third one, textual confidence. Now, um, this is going... So there, so there you have them setting up their sort of three poles, okay, that, that, they're, that they're, everything they're going to say from here on out in all the other episodes is, is going to be based on these polls, okay? Absolutism, skepticism, and then what they're calling confidence uh, in the middle, all right? And they are saying that when you get out at the extreme, what they consider to be the extremes, ab absolutism and, you just heard them say it, absolutism and skepticism, the horseshoe theory is that, well, as the horseshoe bends, the, the pole, as the poles bend, they get closer together to the point where they're basically... Uh, saying similar things, sounding very similar, yet trying to maintain their distinctiveness, okay? So understand, it's important if we're going to engage with the material here that we understand what is being said. And so we want to give them an opportunity to sort of stake that out without necessarily, without, certainly without misrepresenting what they're saying and understanding it accurately. If you're going to be an interlocutor with somebody, the first step is you got to you got to clearly understand what's being said and not misrepresent it, okay? Now, um that said, I want to kind of go through uh some things here that from my point of view, all right? So I want to talk about some governing first principles. I think this is a, a pertinent place to talk about it. So every worldview begins with a set of governing presuppositions or first principles. These are from my notes, the word for all ages. These principles characterize and determine and set forth the circumscribed boundaries by which the given worldview judges and accepts what ideas are true or valid. All right. So wh wh whether you're going to talk about absolutism or skepticism or confidence, there's there's a set of presuppositions there that are going to be involved. Okay. As a Bible-believing Christian, I ought to be looking to God's Word to establish my governing presuppositions of how I should think and approach the Scriptures. So as a conservative, Bible-believing Christian, God's Word is my final authority. It, it is absolute. If, it, if I disagree with it, it is right and I am wrong, and it is, should be and ought to be, from a Protestant point of view, the final arbiter in what we believe. Now, it ought to be the final arbiter, not about 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 what we believe about the Bible. It ought to be the final arbiter about what the, we believe the Bible says about itself, as far as inspiration and preservation is concerned. Okay, when we look at God's word to teach us how to think about God's book, we encounter the following biblical first principles. Number one, God exists. Now, I'm not going to look up all these verses. You can do this on your own time. Psalm 14, verse one. Number two, God has magnified his word above his name, Psalm 138, verse 2. Now, that's the, that's just a statement. I'm not confounding that with any particular Bible version. It's just a general statement that God has magnified his word above his name. And number three, God's word is eternally settled in heaven, Psalm 119, 89. I believe God knew what his word would be before he moved upon any human authors via inspiration to reveal his word to mankind. Number four, God, through the process of inspiration, has communicated his word to mankind. Um, was that number three? That was number four. <laughs> number five, God's words were written down so that they could be made eternally available to men. Isaiah 30, verse 8, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 
God can't lie, Titus 1, 2. God promised to preserve that which he inspired. And we have a host of verses here related to preservation, okay? So generally speaking, the first six of these presuppositions are not in dispute among leading evangelical and fundamental believers. However, the same could not be said for, should say, the seventh principle regarding preservation. Much ink has been spilt debating the doctrine of preservation. And that's essentially going to be very front and center in the discussions of the Textual Confidence uh, Collective. Some deny the promise of preservation altogether and claim that the Bible teaches no such doctrine. According to this view, the New Testament text was lost and needs to be reconstructed using naturalistic, unbiased, and neutral methodologies of the science of textual criticism. Others maintain that the scriptures do teach their own preservation, but that this preservation occurred in all the extant manuscripts and textual witnesses. Therefore, textual criticism is necessary to sift and weigh the evidence in order to reconstruct the original text. Now, it's important that we are clear about this. The first two positions disagree about the, bi the biblical promise of preservation, but agree that the text needs to be reconstructed via the so-called science of textual criticism. Still others believe that preservation is a biblical promise that God accomplished by preserving a particular specific body of manuscripts. So, that's where the collective is going to be using uh, absolutist terminology uh, when it comes to this, uh, this position right here. We'll see more about that in the future. In his book, A More Sure Word, Which Bible Can You Trust? Dr. R. B. Olette states the following regarding why preservation is a hotly debated topic. Quote, preservation is highly debated today because ultimately the preservation issue will decide the translation issue. And preservation is completely a matter of faith in God's power and word. That's from page 33 of Olet's book. So why is preservation then so hotly debated? Because the facts on the ground are not as neat and tidy as we might like to think. Listen, I believe in preservation because I believe the word of God teaches preservation. I believe that the Bible, teach one of the teachings, bibliology, one of the teachings that the Bible has regarding itself is that God would preserve what he inspired. So I, as a believing biblicist, as a scripturalist, I believe in preservation because the Bible teaches its own preservation the same way it teaches its own inspiration. Okay. However, the situation is not as neat and tidy as we might like. All right. So fact number one, the original autographs are not extent. They don't exist. No one, that, that's a fact that no one on either side of the sort of discussion or either side of the theological aisle, if you will, or the textual aisle is going to disagree with because we don't have the, the, the original autographs are not extant. All, all we have are autographs. We have copies of the originals, not the autographs themselves. Fact number two, no two editions of the Hebrew Masoretic texts are exactly the same in terms of wording. So my term for this is verbatim identicality. There is not verbatim identicality in every Hebrew in every Hebrew manuscript of the Masoretic text. There, there's not verbatim identicality. There is a high degree of identicality, but there is not exact Xeroxed verbatim identicality in terms of wording in editions of the Hebrew Masoretic text. Fact three, no two Greek manuscripts, even the manuscripts of the Byzantine majority are exactly the same. There is not verbatim identicality. No, no two printed editions of the Textus Receptus are exactly the same. That's fact four. Fact five, no two editions of the King James Bible are exactly the same or verbatim in all of their wording. Fact six, the King James differs from modern versions. See, this, this is where... This is where I differ from um, Mark Ward. I, uh, I can even acknowledge that there are some false friends in the King James Bible. There are some words through 400 years of language change that don't mean the same thing today that they meant 400 years ago in the early 17th century when the King James Bible was produced. And I can acknowledge that and I can see that that's true. Uh, even from my own study before I even read uh, Brother Ward's book, um, Authorized. But where I diverge from Brother Ward is I, 
I cannot there also make the leap to say that there are not substantive differences in meaning between the TR and the King James and the critical text and modern versions. All right. So no two, uh, the King James differs from modern versions and no two modern versions read exactly the same. Um, one of the lessons I have in my class is to demonstrate that modern versions don't even agree on basic factual information, like what the tabernacle was made out of, for example, or, you know, how long uh, certain things took place uh, in the Old Testament. And so there, there, there's no, they're not even exactly the same with each other. But But that's a point that nobody really wants to talk about is not only do not only does the king james differ from modern versions but modern versions differ uh, amongst themselves about basic factual information and so we have to acknowledge whatever we're going to say about the text whatever we're going to say about these things in my opinion we have to acknowledge these facts okay now kevin bowder in one bible stands alone says the following about this that the preservation of the word of God depends upon the exact preservation of the words of the original documents and the situation is dire. No two manuscripts contain exactly the same words. No two editions of the Masoretic text contain exactly the same words. No two editions of the Textus Receptus contain exactly the same words. No two modifications of the King James Bible contain exactly the same words. The Bible nowhere tells us which edition, if any, does contain the exact words of the original. These are not speculations. These are plain facts. Folks, the facts on the ground are that there is a certain level of variance. Okay? There just is. So whatever position one is going to adopt on the text, the translation issue, is going to have to take into account, it seems to me, the facts of the case as they actually exist. And the facts of the case are is that there is not verbatim identicality of wording. Okay? There's just not. So, for me, um, in, in my thinking, this is a key point, all right? So, given the biblical principle that God has preserved his word, so you have to wrestle with preservation. See, here's what happens. Conservatives spill much ink, argue, theological conservatives spill much ink arguing for verbal plenary inspiration. That is the preservation of the every word and not just the thoughts, not just the concepts, not just the ideas, but every word. And then what happens is then um, some people then confound preservation with inspiration and say that, well, preservation had to occur. Preservation had to occur with verbatim identicality, with Xerox identicality, with exact sameness and wording. OK, now. Given the biblical principle that God preserved his word, as well as the historical and textual facts, the following points are inescapable. So whatever we're going to say, now I can believe in preservation, and I do believe in preservation as a Bible doctrine, but I also acknowledge that preservation did not occur with verbatim identicality. Okay, and we'll talk more about why I think that in, in, in future lessons. But Biblic given the biblical principle that God preserved his word, as well as the historical and textual facts, the following points are inescapable. Number one, God promised to preserve his word. Hands down, without a doubt, preservation is a Bible promise. Okay. Number two, God did not see fit to preserve his word by preserving the original autographs. So number one here, God preserves his word. But the preservation did not occur by a, a preser by preserving the original autographs. How do I know? Because the originals no longer exist. If God needed to have the originals to accomplish preservation, then we would have the originals. But we don't, yet God promised preservation as a, as a biblical promise. Number three, God did not supernaturally overtake the pen of every scribe, copyist, or typesetter who ever handled the text to ensure that no differences of any kind enter the text. How do I know? Because differences at every there's difference differences in wording exist, variance exists at every level of the discussion. Right? So if the standard for preservation is verbatim identicality of wording, why didn't God just preserve the originals and remove all doubt? I mean, if 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 verb if verbatim identicality, if Xerox identicality was the standard for preservation, 
Didn't God know that a bunch of fundamentalists and evangelicals in the late 19th, 20th, and 21st century would be arguing about the text, arguing about preservation, arguing about all of this? All of this could have been avoided if he just would have preserved the originals, okay? But he didn't do that, yet he promised preservation. So if the standard for preservation is verbatim identicality of wording, why did God not just preserve the originals and thereby remove all doubt? The reason is God wants people to walk by faith in their view of the biblical text. He wants you to walk by faith as a believer, and he wants you to walk by faith in your view of the text. Okay, so there is a faith element here that cannot be avoided. All right. Now, as I have thought about this. And here's where I will put this up here. I want to present to you what I'm calling a scriptural model for dealing with textual variants. And this is going to be probably coming up here um, a lot. So we start up here in the left corner, plenary verbal inspiration, Bible's assertion for itself. So plenary verbal inspiration is the Bible's assertion for itself. It teaches the preservation, sorry, the inspiration of the words, the graphe, that which is written down. Okay. The Bible also promises preservation. Preservation is Bible's claim for itself as well through these verses that we will, uh, I'm not going to expound all of them right here. Now. Here's what happens. Preservation is the corollary of inspiration. It is reasonable to conclude that preservation occurred with the same precision as inspiration, i.e. plenary verbal. But many mistakenly assume that this requires verbatim identicality of wording. The false, this false assumption underlies the entire textual variant discussion and leads to unscriptural conclusions. Folks, I believe that the entire discussion and debate related to text and translation is predicated on an underlying assumption that preservation requires verbatim identicality of wording. Okay, so that assumption, that confounding of things is what is driving this. In fact, in his book, The Byzantine Text Type, and New Testament textual criticism, Harry A. Sturz talks about this on page 38, where he's addressing the issue of verbal or uh, providential preservation and the issue of inspiration and whether or not preservation is the corollary of inspiration. And he says it should be pointed out that providential preservation is not a necessary consequence of inspiration. Now, it Sturz is an interesting case because he believes in he believes in preservation, he believes in inspiration. But what he what he's also going to say here is that error people's faith has been confounded and overthrown when they inextricably link inspiration and preservation too closely and therefore make assumptions regarding inspira- uh, preservation um that don't do not cohere with the facts on the ground, as I've already covered earlier in this video. It should be pointed out that providential preservation is not a necessary consequence of inspiration. Preservation of the Word of God is promised in Scripture, and inspiration and preservation are related doctrines, but they are distinct from each other, and there is a danger in making one the necessary corollary of the other. So Sturz believes in inspiration and preservation, but what he is cautioning against is drawing too close a corollary between these two doctrines. The scriptures do not do this. God, having given the perfect salvation, sorry, given perfect revelation by verbal inspiration, was under no special or logical obligation to see that man did not corrupt it. And I'm not sure I agree with that, but anyway, he created the first man perfect, but he was under no obligation to keep him perfect. Or to use another illustration, having created all things perfect, God was not obligated to see that the pristine perfection of the world was maintained. In his providence, the world was allowed to suffer the fall and to endure a defacement of the original condition. It may very well be that the scriptures used to attest the promise to preserve God's word do involve preservation. The point is that this is a different matter than insisting that God, because he inspired the scriptures, is is post facto obligated to preserve them or further is obligated to preserve them in a particular way. Now here, 
One danger of such a position is that the faith of some has been weakened when they have become aware of variant readings in the manuscripts precisely because they have confounded preservation with inspiration. Though both are Bible doctrines, the scriptures, the scripture does not link them inextricably concerning inspiration. The scripture are very specific as to the direct working of the Holy Spirit, the scriptures were God breathed. But while God promised that his word would be preserved, heaven and earth shall not pass away, but my shall pass away, excuse me, but my words will not pass away. He did not stipulate in the scripture that he would keep Christian scribes from error, or that or that the type of the text with the most copies would be the best text. Now, uh, Sturz is ultimately arguing for the Byzantine text type and that it should have a seat at the table of New Testament textual criticism to say is the same as the so-called Alexandrian text. And he is also arguing, based upon the papyri, that the Byzantine text is as old as anything that is in the uh, Alexandrian text. But notice what he says. A danger of such a position is that the faith of some has been weakened when they become aware of variant readings. Now, this video is already long, and so I'm not going to get into the men telling their the men on the collective telling their story. But I think when we do that in the next video, particularly as we listen to Brother Berg's testimony, that it was realizing about variant readings and what he had been taught regarding preservation that really sort of uh, threw him for a loop, so to speak. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it really caused him to have to question things and moved him away from a pro-Texas Receptus, pro-King James position, not saying Brother Berg is against those things, okay, but and that, but more into a, uh, a favorable position towards the critical text and modern versions, okay? Let me, let me bring this back up. So this false assumption that preservation required verbatim identicality, I think, is underlying the entire textual debate, okay? So follow the arrow. Caution. Variant readings are a historical fact. No two Greek manuscripts, even Byzantine, editions of the text of Septus or printing of the King James are identical. This leads to the realization that preservation did not occur with verbatim identicality of wording. So then you have two, you have a couple options. Option one, the original's only position. This position confines inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy to the non-existent original autographs as a means of dealing with the variant readings. Advocates argue that it is their job to reconstruct the biblical text. This position is non-scientific and non-falsifiable. In the absence of the original, how does one know whether they have accurately reconstructed the text? The position is not one of the position is one of no practical consequence and cannot be maintained by faith in God's word. So one option in dealing with this, the, the lack of verbatim identicality, is to say, is to confine everything to the original autographs and say, well, the originals are inerrant because they got everything right. Every jot and tittle of it is correct, and so therefore only those are inerrant, okay? The second option is faith for faith's sake. Pretends like variant readings do not exist and insist upon plenary verbal preservation. Some incorrectly assert that God re-inspired his word in English between 1604 and 1611 as a means of providing the verbatim identicality of wording that this view of preservation demands. This view has the correct starting point it consists with the believing approach to scripture, but carries the corollary between preservation and inspiration too far. I believe these two are dead ends. Now I'm going to have to close out my window here to show you option three. Option three is to amend one's position on preservation. The facts need not overthrow one's belief in the promise of preservation. Rather, one should look back to the scriptures that taught them to believe in preservation in the first place to learn how to think about variant readings. When one does this, they will conclude that the insistence upon the standard of verbatim identicality was excessive and an overstatement about what the scriptures teach on preservation. Okay, so then we go back to our belief in the Bible. Belief in the scripture leads one to maintain belief in both inspiration and preservation. So I am suggesting here, through my view, that the solution to all of this is not the original's only position. It's not a faith for faith's sake position. It is to biblically amend one's view of preservation, 
look back to the scriptures here that taught you to believe in preservation in the first place and amend our thinking. Okay, the result is a biblically amended position on preservation that drops verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation. If one allows the King James Bible to teach them about the nature of preservation, they will conclude that demanding verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation was overreaching to begin with. And folks, in my view, there are three, there are four scriptural proofs found within the King James Bible itself that support this conclusion. Number one, how the Old Testament quotes itself or how the Old Testament quotes the Old Testament. Number two, how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Number three, how the New Testament quotes the New Testament. And number four, a comparison between 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37. Observing these realities allows one to maintain their belief in the promise of preservation without overstating the facts. This biblically revised position can still be maintained by faith in God's word without abandoning the believing approach to scripture. So let me see if I can get my cam back on here. There we are. So let's go back. So folks, this chart, I think, and this is where I, I feel I differ from the men on the collective. The men on the collective encountered the variant readings and they they turned to the academy for how to think about it and how to deal with the problem, how to, how to deal with the situation. Okay. What I'm suggesting through my study and research, et cetera, is that we don't turn to the academy, but we turn back to the book that taught us to believe in inspiration, that taught us to believe in preservation in the first place. And we say, okay, what does this book teach us about how we should think about the question of variant readings? And that to me is the fundamental difference between the, my approach and the approach of the men on the collective is what do we do about this? How do we handle the existence of variant readings? Okay. And I believe that we can maintain a belief in preservation and we can look to the Bible itself to answer now the secondary question of how should we think about variant readings and allow the scriptures to teach us how to think about the matter. And I think right here, there are four scriptural proofs that preservation does not require verbatim identicality of wording, the Old Testament's use of itself, the New Testament's use of the Old Testament, the New Testament's use of itself, and a comparison between 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37. Now, this, and I believe when we get back into the collective videos, when we get back into video one, which we will do more next time, and we listen to Brother Timothy Berg's testimony, I think we'll see that what I'm saying here is relevant because he's going to mention the issue of variance and the questions that this posed for him and how he sought to deal with those. And let me just say, I myself have also dealt with the same thing. In 2011, I was handed a copy of David Norton's book, A Textual History of the King James Bible, and I was presented with the reality that what I had been told by leading lights in the King James Only movement about the text was not in line with the facts, and it caused for me somewhat of my own existential crisis, if you will. But instead of turning to the academy to tell me how to think about it, I turned back to the Bible and I said, God, what do you have to say? How would your word teach me to think about the issue of variant readings? And so my thoughts on this that I'm going to be covering as I interact with the material of the collective are going to be based on sort of that framework. Okay. So we've heard in this video, this video has already been long. I've set up a bunch of, I've set up why I'm doing this. We've talked about the different men on the collective. Uh, we heard their, their uh, discussion of their three polls. And I have presented in this video, my scriptural model for dealing with textual variants that will be coming up as we look at and interact with this material. So I present this for the consideration of the body of Christ. Um, understand this is the first video. I am fully aware of the fact that there's much more to discuss and flush out related to this. 
but I want to present to you here this scriptural model for dealing with textual variants. Okay. I appreciate everybody giving this their attention. If the men on the collective watch this, um, I, I, I truly um, hope that you will at least uh, give this some thought, some consideration uh, as we go through this. I mean nobody any ill will. Um, some of you I've interacted with personally, and I have enjoyed those uh, interactions immensely, even, on, even when we have not agreed with one another. And I want to invite everybody. We are having a Bible conference. I want to. I got to wrap this video up somehow. I want to invite everybody. Our 2022 West Michigan Grace Bible Conference. We are going to be studying the weapons of our warfare, understanding the nature of our spiritual warfare. Our meeting is October 21, 22, and 23 at Grace Life Bible Church. Our speakers are Dave Reed, Greg Reeser, and myself. And we have a whole weekend here set aside to studying the issue of the armor of God and the nature of our spiritual warfare. We'd like to invite all uh, who are listening to attend. Okay. Remember, if, if you have liked this video, if you would consider liking, liking it, sharing it, leaving a comment, uh, uh, we would certainly appreciate that. Don't forget our featured book for the month of uh, September, the King James Bible in America. I will leave links to as many of the different things here that I can. I've closed out of some of the windows. If I fail to do so, it is not intentional. And, um, I appreciate everybody listening to my first video on my thoughts on the Textual Confidence Collective. Um, we will see you next week with video number two.